Welcome to the Michael Shermer Show. I'm your host, Michael Shermer. This episode is brought to you by Wondrium, the former great courses who you've heard me talk about quite a bit because I've uh, consumed their courses for decades and I produced a couple courses on conspiracies and skepticism 101. And now they've expanded to include um, documentary series and films and all different kinds of audio and video content that you can consume uh, by subscription. Sort of like Netflix, you subscribe uh, and you get access to all their courses. It's great. Um, and so to give it a try, you get a free one month uh, trial run uh, through my show. So if you go to wondrium.com slash Shermer, you'll get a free trial uh, and uh, for a month. It's great. So again, it's wondrium.com slash Shermer. And uh, they're, they're our, um, uh, our, our main sponsor of the show, but the underlying support comes through the Skeptic Society. So if you want to support us through them, you go to skeptic.com slash donate. Uh, the Skeptic Society is a 501c3 nonprofit, so your donations are tax-free. And uh, it goes to paying my salary and keeping the office uh, uh, running, and we have employees, and, and, uh, and a magazine to publish, Skeptic Magazine, and all the media work we do, and so on. So your donations support not only the podcast, but all of our efforts. So if you think at this time in history, we need more science education and critical thinking um, and combating bad ideas, fake news, alternative facts, then this is the place to go. That's what we uh, have been doing for 30 years. Sadly, unfortunately, um, this is coming out of time, this 200th and first episode here, this AMA. Upon the death of my uh, longtime friend and co-founder of the Society and Magazine, Pat Lindsay, here's a picture of Pat, and uh, I'll be doing a full tribute to her um, on a special edition of the podcast when we released the next issue of the magazine, which was just about to go to press when uh, Pat died uh, on um, July 24th. So uh, we scrapped a whole final section of the magazine and are devoting that to her. And so I wrote a tribute, which I will read and talk a little bit more about her uh, informally at a later time. <clears throat> it's still kind of raw and, uh, and emotional at the moment, but just as a brief thing, here's a picture of uh, when Pat and I started the magazine in 1992. That's in my garage. Yes. Um, if, you're, if you're listening to this, it's just a typical cluttered garage with a desk and a bunch of books piled up. And that's Pat on the phone answering the phone. That's how we started. It was just, uh, just kind of a hobby, just for fun. And it just kept getting bigger and bigger. And we finally moved out of that garage into the rest of the house, which was my house at the time. I uh, sold the house um, to a uh, philanthropist who then donated it to the society. So um, we do save that. So your donations go to our actual content production, not a brick and mortar building. We own the building. Uh, here's Pat Manning, uh, our book staffing our book table um, at a at Caltech with one of our lecture series. This one on Carl Sagan. Those are the two biographies of Carl that came out at the same time. And here's a fun little picture of uh, Pat in the mountains in San Gabriel. This is actually in my backyard of my other house in Altadena. She's holding a stick with a UFO at the end of it with fishing line that you can't, of course, can't see. Uh, and uh, so this was a, for an episode of a television show exploring the unknown in which we showed how easy it is to fake UFO photos. <clears throat> okay, uh, that's enough on that. I love this particular cover that Pat commissioned through Astor Alexander, the artist on the flat earth, he tries to capture what the actual image of what it's supposed to look like in space. Well, <clears throat> there's no space. The dome around it is everything, so they say. But more importantly, who says the earth is flat and why do they say it? It's such a great title that Pat came up with. And um, the next uh, cover of the magazine will have uh, a tribute to her as well. I always like this particular cover that Pat did on Roswell. The flying saucer crashed in a farm with sheep. Um, it's really uh, classic. Anyway, so um, this, this uh, again, uh, marks our uh, 200th anniversary of the episodes of the show. So this is the 201st episode. 
And uh, so I'm going to devote that to um, the NAMA. We got tons of questions for this one. I solicited them there for uh, actually several weeks and finally got around to recording these. So I will just give you who is asking the question. And if they say where they're from, I'll include that too. So here's one from Rick Leyland. I enjoyed your recent interview with Dr. Meyer regarding his book, The God Hypothesis. This is Stephen Meyer, who's an intelligent design creationist. In the interview, both of you referred to the mind. My question is whether a mind can exist without a brain. Does the mind require a physical structure, the brain, in order for thoughts, ideas, emotions, etc., to be formed? Dr. Meyer, in the latter part of your interview, stated something like, minds think ideas. Isn't it the physical structure of the brain that produces ideas? I find this nebulous word, mind, to be similar as in stating we feel in our heart. Thanks again for your wonderful and thoughtful podcast. Okay, Rick. Yes, of course, I agree with you completely. This is the position of materialist monism. That is, there's just one substance, monism, uh, as opposed to dualism, where there's two substances, that is, body and soul, brain and mind, corporeal and incorporeal, material, non-material, so forth. Um, and most scientists today, I'd say, are monists. They think there's just body, no soul. There's just brain. There's no mind. Uh, but I can't say that that's the majority position um, by any means. Most people are natural-born dualists, as Paul Bloom likes to say. We're born as young children, actually, conceiving of the world of, as having dualistic properties. And thoughts uh, feel like they're floating around up there in the brain because you can't sense your neurons operating. The brain doesn't sense itself. It doesn't feel pain. You get brain surgery, they, they put you out because they got to cut through all your skin and muscles and tissues and ligaments and bone and all that stuff, the dura matter surrounding the brain to get to the brain. But then they can wake you up and tap the brain and poke around in there and you'll have all kinds of interesting experiences. It's one of the ways that the brain has been mapped. Um, and, uh, and, and yet when we do that, for example, when you tap certain areas of the brain, certain mind experiences happened. Um, and so you could touch like this area of the fusiform gyrus in the temporal lobe, and that's associated with facial recognition. And people with damage to this area of the brain, for example, can't see faces or faces are grossly distorted or worst case scenario, they don't even recognize their own face. And uh, so if you think, well, what is it they see? Well, so Oliver Sacks had a patient like this and described, you know, looking at this face like it was an apple with two wormholes and a slit where the mouth is. You know, it's just inconceivable to us. But the point is that no brain, no mind, if there's no physical structure, there's no thoughts. And we know from Alzheimer's, for example, senility, dementia, that when the neurons die, whatever it is they were doing, their mind function is gone, gone forever, unless you rewire the brain through uh, training. And uh, so people that experience brain damage, for example, or strokes or seizures or whatnot, they, they go through therapy and they can learn to rewire their brains to pick up the functions that were uh, being conducted by the part of the brain that died. So the evidence is pretty overwhelming that brain causes mind. But to be fair to Dr. Meyer and, and other dualists is that um, uh, the they think that the mind exists separately. Uh, Dr. Meyer's case, I think he thinks that, you know, God, the Holy Spirit, in some kind of non-corporeal stuff, or not stuff, agent, agency, intelligence, exists separate from physical stuff. And that includes mind. And most theists also throw in their morality as well. <laughs> so, again, uh, in my mind, no brain, no mind. In, in my mind. And in fact, the word mind is just a word we use to describe what the brain is doing when it's operating. And, and it's always good to remember, this is from my behaviorist training, uh, that we use words and then we reify them as if they're happening in the head. Uh, but, but we have to remember, they're just words we're using to describe what we think is happening. He remembered, she figured it out, and so on, as if, you know, as if remembering is some module in the brain but you know that's not how memory works and but but we reify these ideas intelligence is floating around up there mind is floating around up there 
Anyway. Okay, related to this, Joe Simonetta, Simonetta, excuse me. If one believes there is intelligent design to life, like your guest, Stephen Meyer, why would one refer to the designer as a god? Especially a god conceived on our own image. Quite an anthropocentric leap. One can understand that kind of thinking thousands of years ago, in the infancy of our intelligence, in the formative years of religions before the scientific revolution, the Enlightenment and the Age of Reason. But today, if some kind of intelligent thing created life so very long ago, that thing could just as well have been what we call a computer or something along those lines. Or by a computer created by a computer created by a computer ad infinitum in a limitless universe. And then related to that, Rick uh, Dixon asks, vis-a-vis -vis Shermer's last law, what would be a reasonable estimate as to how advanced some ETIs would be based on the age of the universe, star formation, et cetera, 5 billion, 8 billion years in our technological future? Okay, I lump these together because uh, what Rick Dixon is referring to there, there, Shermer's last law is one of the uh, columns I wrote in Scientific American that I expanded into uh, a much longer paper and then part of a chapter in my book, The Believing Brain. Any sufficiently advanced extraterrestrial intelligence would be indistinguishable from God. Of course, this is a play on Arthur C. Clarke's third law. Any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. So what we have here is the, this idea that uh, if a god is so far advanced to be omniscient, omnipotent, uh, then they could do any. It could do anything, like create life. Well, uh, you know, this is probably just an engineering problem. You know, we're pretty close to being able to do this ourselves. I mean, J. Craig Venter, you know, one of the uh, the two decoders of the human genome, you know, has created some primitive life forms with a, a kind of crude DNA type structure. And, uh, and and that's just after half a century of research on uh, genetics since Crick and Watson 53. So if we're able to do that just half a century, how about instead of 50, 60, 70 years, it was 5,000 years of technological development or 50,000 years or 500,000 years. So this is my point. If we're going to encounter extraterrestrial intelligences, they're not going to be just ahead of us. First of all, they won't be behind us because we just achieved uh, inter uh, we just achieved space travel. So um, they're going to uh, if if we're if they're coming here, we're going to encounter them here. Uh, they're going to be more advanced than us, and it's not going to be just like five years ahead of us or ten years ahead of us. You know, like this Roswell story here. I held up this uh, issue of skeptic. You know, the, the the conspiracy theory behind it is that. The aliens brought to us um, basically silicon chip technology. You know, we were using vacuum tubes for the crudest, earliest computers, and and the the aliens gave us this you know technology that was you know roughly ten years ahead of where where we were. They're not going to be ten years ahead of us, okay? They're going to be you know ten thousand years ahead of us, ten million years ahead of us, because the chances of finding them anywhere are so slim, and the chances of another sentient being being in perfect evolutionary parallel time frame with us is pretty much zero. So they're going to be way ahead of us or way behind us. If they're way behind us, we'd have to encounter them by going someplace. So if we encounter them here, then they have to be way advanced. What would we call a being that's capable of doing these super advanced things? Well, if you don't know the technology, you call it God. So I think that's probably what's behind this. And and I, I have made this point to Stephen Meyer and other intelligent design creationists. You know, how would you know if you encountered God that it wasn't just a super advanced extraterrestrial intelligence? It doesn't have to be flesh and blood. It doesn't even have to be a hardware computer. You know, it, it, you know, there are sci-fi scenarios of alien, you know, alien intelligence just on, in light. Just the light itself carries the intelligence. They don't have to be a physical being at all, or structure, or can, even a computer. No. So, sort of like a cloud computing system. Somewhere there has to be. Hardware, but um, but you could have the essentially the software that you encounter and engage with if you um, it, it, it detect them, say through laser technology or radio waves or whatever. The signals themselves don't have to be physical. So um, if you encounter a being capable of creating life, even engineering planets and stars, you know, there's sci-fi scenarios where you know we could do that. It's an engineering problem. You need a lot of energy. 
We don't have even remotely enough energy to pull that kind of thing off, but that would be the idea. And then if you want to get super sci-fi crazy, you could go all the way out to something like um, in geoengineering the collapse of a star into a black hole that uh, through uh, its collapse of the singularity generates a new universe, if that scenario uh, is turns out to be correct. So here you would have an intelligent, sentient being capable of creating universes and life and planets and so forth. That's what God is. That's what the attributes of God. So really, <laughs> I, I, I don't know what you would mean by God if, if it wouldn't be something like what I just described. Of course, theists also talk about you know, it being supernatural, that is, outside of the natural world outside of space and time. Well, okay, that's possible, but how would you know? Because we can't reach outside of space and time. We are natural beings in a natural world locked in our space and time. So there'd be no way to know. It's just a concept. It's just an assertion. Uh, it's like Sagan's dragon that I, I'm fond of talking about. You know, the invisible dragon that can't be detected. You know, it's invisible, it floats above the ground, it, it doesn't give off any heat or any signature of any kind. What's the difference between an invisible, floating, indetectable dragon and no dragon at all? Same problem here. You know, if, if God is outside of space and time and, and inconceivable to a, a finite being like ourselves, then how do you know? And if you, if the answer is, well, I know through revelation, I get voices in my head or I, I experience the love of God or whatever, that's just too human. That's a kind of a human emotional expression of a of a sense of something that we know in other contexts is definitely not true. Ghosts and poltergeists and angels and demons and aliens that abduct people in the middle of the night. These things are not real. They're not happening out there. They're happening in here. And if that's what you mean by God, then it's just up there. Now, that God in your head might be real. <laughs> in your head, it's real but not real out there in the world. Okay, let's continue. Here is Wade from Cape Town, South Africa. I have a question. In one of the Big Think videos, you spoke about life after death, and you asked, how does anyone know where they'll go after death? Convince me that I can trust your word over God's. Well, Wade, I don't know I can convince you uh, my word is better than God's. Um, that assumes God exists, of course, and I assume the way you're asking me that question, uh, you believe in God. Well, so, okay, nobody knows what happens after you die, okay? But where were you before you were born? Just let that sink in for a minute. Where were you before you were born? Now, most people ask this question, too. They go, nowhere. Like, But usually it's followed by a puzzled look, like, what the hell are you talking about? I wasn't anywhere before I was born. Right. That's where you're going after death. Nowhere. Uh, well, of course, that's not what most people think and hope. And, well, you know, truth be told, I'd be fine. It'd be fine with me if I woke up after closing my eyes, whatever waking up would mean, uh, in some other realm, some quantum field or some place that you know, Christians call heaven or whatever you want to call it. And there were my friends and family members and people I loved and knew and so forth, that, that would be great. Hopefully it wouldn't be too hot. <laughs> but really, come on, all this is just fraught with human history, human psychology, human anthropology and sociology. You know, these afterlife constructs, you know, we made up. And you know, I wrote a whole book about this, uh, Heavens on Earth, you know, about why, why we conceive of an afterlife and continuing on back to the brain the brain can't sense itself, so you cannot conceive of yourself not conceiving of yourself. I can put it that way. That is, if I say picture yourself dead, you can't do it because you're picturing yourself. To picture yourself, you have to be alive. So, you know, you might imagine, well, it's something like going under general anesthesia. You know, you count backwards from 98, 99, you know, 97, 96, boom, out, lights out. And uh, then you wake up. But in this case, you just wouldn't wake up probably what happens. And uh, again, could be wrong. No one knows for sure. But if you say, well, God knows, or I know that there is because God told me, well, how do you know God told you? If you say, well, I read it in this book. Well, okay. It's a book. It's written by people. 
well, it was dictated by God or inspired by God. Well, you don't know that. You weren't there. Uh, you just have the word of people who said they spoke to God or they were inspired by God. Uh, so it still comes down to what you consider reliable, trustworthy knowledge and people just asserting claims like, I spoke to God. In another context, if it wasn't your religion, you, you would be as skeptical as I am. And, uh, and, and, and most religious people are skeptical of other religions, just not their own. Okay, David Alit had a born-again experience seven years ago, and I am 41 now. And I'm coming to believe that it is possible that my brain manufactured it due to belief along with coincidence. And while I do not fully comprehend what coincidence means, I'm fairly certain that it probably isn't God now. So that being said, could you please tell me what happened to you when you were born again, when you were younger? What exactly happened to you that made you believe in God, generated, regenerated you, and all that fluff? <laughs> well, fluff, right? Uh, well, I've told this story many times on podcasts. I've written about it in several of my books and so on. I was a born-again evangelical Christian in high school. Okay, that's not unusual, particularly when I was in high school in the early 70s, and the kind of born-again movement was taking off, and uh, it was kind of a thing, not non-denominational. You know, we weren't crazy about religion, just, just, just you and God. You could communicate with God directly through prayer and just thoughtful reflection and reading the Bible. So that's what I did. Uh, but I got serious into it, and I went to Pepperdine University, which is Church of Christ School, and I took courses in the Old Testament and the New Testament and the life of Jesus and the writings of C.S. Lewis and so forth, and, and it was quite enlightening, enlightening. So I know the Bible pretty well. I know the stories. I know the, the worldview. I felt it. I lived it. I really believed it. And then I didn't. Uh, seven years later in graduate school in an experimental psych program at Cal State Fullerton, I just finally just kind of gave it up. And largely in part due to what um, correspondent here was hinting at, just kind of an understanding of how the world works, including coincidence. So one of the things you learn in an experimental psych program is, is uh, research methods and statistics, which gives you some sense that uh, the world is very probabilistic, including our knowledge about it. And this leads to a completely different understanding of coincidences. That is, things just happen. Law of large numbers and so forth, just you know, probabilities, statistics, uh, randomness. Um, when you're a Christian, you think all that happens for a reason. Um, but when you're not a Christian, it's clear, obviously, there's no reason behind it. You know, you got this parking spot, whereas you didn't get the parking spot the day before. You got the job, uh, this job instead of that job, or you married that person instead of this person. In a, in a religious worldview, that all makes sense. It was all orchestrated from above. In a secular worldview, a scientific worldview, it's obvious that's not what's going on. You know, just things happen. It's just luck or bad luck, good luck, bad luck, contingency. And uh, to me, that's one of the most powerful tools of critical thinking, uh, of understanding the role of probabilities. That's why I assigned to my Chapman University Skepticism 101 course students the uh, Leonard Malandow's book, The Drunkard's Walk. It's about the role of chance and probabilities in, in life. It, it's everywhere. Most of what happens is happens in a probabilistic nature that you have very little control over. And when you, after the fact, look at what happened, we impose patterns and agency and, and uh, directionality and conspiracy and so forth. But those are just patterns from, in our minds. When you kind of deconstruct them, from a statistical perspective, you see there's no pattern at all. You know, like regression to the mean, for example. Uh, you know, you have an average, and if you have a spike above the average, it, it could be gambling, you just have a winning streak. It could be a sports figure that, that all of a sudden uh, has, a, has a winning streak or appears on the cover of Sports Illustrated or wins a gold medal or whatever. Um, and, and then by definition, that's so rare that they're going to regress back to their mean of their performance level. And then we impose on that, oh, he's on a hot streak, or oh, she's having a cold streak. Or it, There's no there's no streaks. <laughs> you know, the streaks are purely statistical. They're not, they have nothing to, very little to do with human psychology, except to the extent that you think you might be on a streak, and maybe that gives you more confidence or not. 
Um, but even that may not be true. Anyway, so uh, that's what happened to me. I just kind of gave it up. That's a much longer story, but, uh, but but that's probably good for now. I do think that uh, if we taught students, not just college students, I think this should be done in high school. It is a lot of students, a lot of professors, teachers use my books, for example, and articles from Skeptic Magazine uh, for high school level. Well, it should, we have junior skeptic. It should be middle school. It should be uh, grammar school. Just teaching kids how to think about like monsters or Bigfoot or UFOs, fun stuff like that. Um, you know, but that, that teaches them how to think about anything is being true or not likely to be true or less likely to be true in, in a probabilistic nature. Okay, Rick Leyland asks, if we cannot conclusively detect a supernatural agent using any of our senses, can we then conclude that the agent is non-existent? In other words, does non-detectable equal non-existent? Or if it is undetectable, how do we know it exists? In a related query, if the outcome and event is the same, whether a supernatural agent exists or does not exist, then it is valid to conclude and is it valid to conclude that the supernatural agent does not exist? Like this is related to what I was talking about before, but here we're kind of flipping the valence of the question to uh, what should we conclude when we can't conclude anything? Can you then definitively say there is no supernatural agent? Well, technically, no. But why would you start with that assumption in the first place? That is to say, the burden of proof is not on me to show that there is no supernatural agent. Uh, and then you give me the evidence and I have to decide whether it's good or not. If you say, well, I think there's a supernatural agent, but I can't prove it, then it's really the end of the conversation. I, it's not The person can't say to me, well, can you, can you disprove that there's a supernatural agent or can you prove that there is no supernatural agent? No, but the null hypothesis in science says that your hypothesis is not true until proven otherwise. So go ahead, give it your best shot. But you can't say to me, I think X exists and you have to prove that it doesn't. So, and if you can't, then it exists. No, that's a fallacy of logic. Any more than if, if you went to the FDA and say, I have the cure for COVID-19. And Dr. Fauci and whoever says, okay, what have you got? And you got, I got nothing, but I heard that it works or I tried it and, you know, my headache went away or whatever. Sorry, that's not reliable evidence. We can't therefore conclude that the null hypothesis is false. The null hypothesis is true until you disprove it otherwise with evidence. The null hypothesis being that your hypothesis is not true. Okay, so that's how to think about that. And we don't have to go any further than that. Raphael Palice asks, would you deny that the only possible rational hypothesis about something is that it came from nothing. Nothing is the absolute negativity. It reaches the point of denying itself. Something being comes about. Thus, from that point on, the universe is the ever-developing conflict between nothingness and somethingness. Okay. <laughs> well, I wrote a whole essay about this. Why is there something rather than nothing? This is in my book, Giving the Devil His Due. It was originally published in Skeptic. It's a fairly long article. It addresses this age-old question, uh, why is there something rather than nothing? And then related to that is, you know, why this universe? Why are we, Why is it fine-tuned the way it is and so on? Um, I'm not going to read you this is like a 5,000-word essay. I'm just going to read a portion to it. The problem, the reason I'm going to read this short portion here is that I think the question is ill-conceived. It's a conceptual problem, not a scientific problem. That is to say, what do you mean by nothing? So the concept of nothing is problematic. Here's what I mean. So a couple points here. Um, and, and by the way, here I'm, I'm leaning on um, a book from John Leslie and Robert Lawrence Kuhn called The Mystery of Existence. Why is there anything at all? And this, is a, this is a really good book. It's, you know, like, I don't know, 10 times the length of my essay. So each of these points... Uh, they have entire chapters devoted to it. So it's a big question. First, nothing is inconceivable. Um, as suggested above, it is impossible to conceptualize nothing. No space, time, matter, light, darkness, or even conscious beings to perceive the nothingness. As Robert Kuhn concedes that not just emptiness, 
not just blankness, and not just emptiness and blankness forever, but not even the existence of emptiness, not even the meaning of blankness, and no forever. Inconceivable. I mean, what does that even mean? I don't even know what I'm talking about. I'm reading the words, but I don't know what it means. Nobody does, okay? Second point, nothing is something. The analytic philosopher Quentin Smith pointed out to Kuhn that it is a logical fallacy to talk about nothing as if it were something. That is to suggest that there might have been nothing implies it is possible that there is no thing. Nothing, no thing. As Kuhn articulates Smith's argument, there is, in quotes, means something is. So there is nothing means something is nothing which is a logical contradiction. His suggestion is to remove nothing and replace it by not something or not anything, since one can talk about what we mean by nothing by referring to something or anything of which there are no instances. In other words, the concept of something has the property of not being instantiated. The common sense way to talk about nothing is to talk about something and negate it, to deny that there is something. Then I continue here. Here we are bumping up against the problem of defining what we mean by nothing and the restrictions that language imposes on the problem. The very act of talking about nothing makes it something. Or else, what are we talking about? Okay, and a final point. Nothing would include, because this is what it's the whole thing points to, nothing would include God's non-existence. <laughs> In Kuhn's taxonomy of nothings, he lists what categories of things might be included in something that would be negated by nothing. Physical, mental, platonic, spiritual, and God. Physical, all matter, energy, space, and time, and all the laws and principles that govern them, known and unknown. Mental, all kinds of consciousness and awareness, known and unknown. Platonic, all forms of abstract objects, numbers, logic, forms. Propositions, possibilities, known and unknown. And finally, spiritual and God. Anything that could possibly fit this non-physical category, all forms of religious and spiritual belief. If by nothing is meant no physical objects or matter of any kind, for example, there can still be energy from which matter may arise by natural forces guided by the laws of nature. Physicists, for example, talk about empty space as seething with virtual particles from which particle-antiparticle pairs come into existence as a consequence of the uncertainty principle of quantum physics. From this nothingness, universes may pop into existence. This is Stephen Hawking and Leonard Malanow's proposition in their book, um, The Grand Design. And continuing. But if by nothing is meant there is no physical, mental, platonic, or non-physical entity of any kind, then there can be no god or gods which means that there cannot be anything outside of nothing out of which to create something. If God is proposed to be outside of or pre-existing the nothing from which the something was created, then why can't the laws of nature that give rise to somethings, like universes, be outside of or pre-existing nothing? Okay, that's enough from reading from that. As you can, this goes on for pages and pages. Um, there's just no reason to to think that this simple question, why, you know, why is there something rather than nothing, therefore God, that does not at all follow. Okay. Randall Akers from Santa Clarita, California. Have you found any evidence to an evolutionary or societal benefit to believing that which is demonstrably false? <laughs> In other words, are there situations where belief is superior to knowledge as a survival strategy? Not just in the theoretical tiger in the tall grass scenario. Here he's referring to my patternicity, the concept, the tendency to find meaningful patterns in random noise, the uh, rustle in the grass. <clears throat> Better to assume it's a dangerous predator than just the wind, just in case. Okay, type two error. Um, he's talking about something else here. Well, yes, I think there is a good argument to be made uh, that it can be beneficial to believe in demonstrably false things. Um, Hugo Mercier makes this argument and Dan Sperber in their book on reason that uh, they argue that, that we evolve the capacity to reason, not for veridical perception. That is to say a correct 
accurate understanding of the physical world through our senses. No, that we reason to win arguments, to convince our fellow groupmates of some particular point we want to make. That it's more of a social, almost political uh, or anthropological idea. It's kind of a truth, a pragmatic truth, rather than empirical truth concept. And there, and and uh, Mercier and and um, Sperber make this argument with quite a few examples and and uh, experiments showing that in fact we do this a lot, um, in particularly in political, economic, ideological, religious settings. Empirical science comes pretty late in the game of human evolution, really, just the last couple centuries. It's the newcomer. So there's no reason to think that we're natural born scientists in that way, although there can be arguments for me that, that have been made um, that, uh, you know, trackers, for example, are testing hypotheses about where they think the animals went and so forth. But um, here I'm, I'm thinking now, of, you know, my next book on conspiracy theories, you know, QAnon. Is it really possible that anyone, any Republican, believes that Democrats led by Hillary Clinton and Tom Hanks and Beyonce and other celebrities are running a secret satanic pedophile ring out of a pizzeria in Washington, D.C.? Does anyone really believe that? Well, one guy did. A guy named uh, Edgar, I think was his name, um, went there with a gun. He went there with an AR-15 and demanded to know where the basement was where the pedophile ring was going. And of course, they said, there is no basement here. <laughs> they shot up into the ceiling and was arrested and went to jail. No one was hurt, fortunately, but you know he was the one guy who believed it. I think most people don't believe it, really. I think it's kind of a tribal loyalty thing. I'm going to signal to my group that I'm so loyal. I'm so loyal, in this case, Republican or conservative, that I'm willing to publicly state, yeah, I think QAnon is Pizzagate, QAnon is larger conspiracy theory surrounding Pizzagate. Um, I'm going to signal my loyalty by saying, yeah, I, publicly, I believe this to be true. I mean, the, the, the figures of belief are staggering. Like a third of Republicans think that there's something to QAnon. And and, uh, and spin off from that, you know, Trump's coming back to the White House any day now and on and on. Okay. So here I think there is a benefit to um, signaling your tribal loyalty that you can be counted on as a consistent and reliable group member. And you are signaling that you believe this crazy idea. This could be ghosts or gods, demons, angels, whatever. You know, and, and like in the case of religion, if I see you there every week um, performing the religious rituals and so forth, I, I know I can count on you. You're a good, reliable group member. Uh, this is an argument I made in uh, how we believe that it's a you know, religions are more of a social uh, entity uh, that kind of binds people together into these cohesive units by which they can get more things done. It's safer uh, from an evolutionary perspective to have that kind of group cohesiveness. So, yes, I think that argument can be made. Paul Smith from Australia says, you have mentioned in a few podcasts that when Mormon women are asked, they frequently respond that they like being a sister wife. I'm referring to this television show, Sister Wives. Your rejoinder to this is along the lines of how could they know they've been embedded in this way of life forever? They have no experience of monogamy to compare it with. My question is this, my question is, is the same not true in reverse? That is, how could people embedded in a monogamous environment for their entire lives know that their way is better? Okay, this is, this is a really good question because, of course, we're all embedded in our particular cultures. In my case, you know, Western, um, well, Judeo-Christian culture, I guess you'd say, and a democratic culture and so on, where uh, monogamy is the rule. That's right. I mean, that has not always been that way. You know, uh, in many, many societies historically, polygamy uh, was sanctioned, or sorry, it was endorsed. And, um, but but when you really kind of dig down into those examples, it's usually just a few powerful males that are enforcing the rules and in some cases the laws about polygamy. Uh, they get most of the women. Well, you know, we know that the sex ratio is pretty close to 50-50. So what happened to all the other guys? Well, too bad for them. In the case of Mormons, they get uh, in these uh, fundamentalist Mormon communities, 
where a lot of these women are groomed to, uh, you know, marry some old guy when they hit their late teens, early 20s. What about all the late teen, early 20 guys they grew up with? Well, they kick them out of the communities. They get rid of them because you can't have a bunch of guys in their early 20s with all that testosterone, you know, walking around and, you know, they're not allowed to, you know, fulfill this part of their life. And that's just not healthy. So I don't think it's natural in in a way uh, from an evolutionary perspective to say, well, polygamy is, you know, the way it always has been. So that's natural. I, I think that had to be enforced uh, with some pretty strict rules. Uh, and that because of the sex ratio, it's 50-50. Uh, I think most anthropologists today uh, describe the human species as uh, being serially monogamous. That is, we trade partners, uh, you know, having multiple uh, marriages, for example, is not that uncommon anymore. Uh, but but within, you know, each marriage, it's a monogamous marriage. Now, there is something you know, called polyamory where you have uh, multiple loves. And apparently some couples can do this. Uh, it's hard for me to picture that happening, and I just—I don't think my wife and I would be vibing that too much. But uh, I can see other people could. Okay, fine, do it. You know, from a from a personal perspective, I don't care what people do, as long as they're happy. Uh, but uh, I just don't think that's quite the case. And uh, those of you who listen to the podcast, you know, I've also also talked about um, this with prostitution. Um, you know, a lot of these young women are addicted to drugs. They're beaten by. Um, the men that are controlling them, the men make the, you know, make most of the money and so on. So it's not a, it's not the kind of free choice one may make, you know, should I get the job at IBM or should I get the job at Google as a programmer? It's not that kind of choice, um, that one makes volitionally, uh, with a well-informed background about what the world is like and what your options are. Okay, Donald Salter from Coon Valley, Wisconsin. How can we get the majority of U.S. citizens to be more scientifically literate so that we as a country can move forward easily? It seems to me that if we had a pool of scientists with varying expertises to freely advise our elected local, state, and federal officials, then said officials could make intelligent statements regarding anything scientific. How can we do this? Well, for starters, you can read Skeptic Magazine. Here we go. <laughs> uh, but we're not the only one, of course. There's other Skeptic Magazines. There's scientific, popular scientific magazines like Popular Science, Scientific American, and so forth. Uh, but obviously, that's not enough. Um, I really think education is the key here. We, we know that uh, these deep biasing programs can work. That is, you teach people about cognitive biases. You teach people how to think. Critically, um, you teach them rationality, you teach them how science works, not just the scientific facts, but how it actually works and uh, and the probabilistic nature of knowledge. And no one knows for sure. This is why we have these tools uh, of science to try to get at what's probably or provisionally true or false and so on. I think this needs to be taught at the local um, and state levels at a lower and lower level grammar school, middle school high school, such that by the time students get to college, they have some idea of how all this works. We have, clearly have a long way to go. And related to the earlier question, a lot of these seemingly purely scientific issues, global warming, vaccines, are so politicized that people simply can't uh, think about them rationally. I mean, they can, but they just don't because it, it goes against the grain of what their political beliefs are. And that's a problem. Uh, somebody named Abel asked, my wife recently had a reading with a medium. She swears that she was told some things that she couldn't know, the, the psychic couldn't know. My wife believes in this. How do I go about explaining to her that it's not true? She just thinks I'm very negative. <laughs> Sorry, Abel, but um, skeptics are often described as negative because we're in a way naysaying. We're saying, no, it's probably not true. In this case, definitely not true. Okay. Well, the reading, these are called cold readings or warm readings. Cold readings are uh, when the psychics read a client cold. They've never met him before. And uh, this is actually not that hard to do. I've done it a number of times. I've written about it uh, in a couple places. And, um, it, you know, the, the, these cold readings have uh, different um, elements to them that make it seem like you're able to get information from them. So you start very broad, you know, the 
the uh, the Barnum uh, effect, where it, you know you just tell people big, big, broad, sweeping generalizations. You know, I, you know, you're you're intelligent, you're creative, you're um, gregarious and outgoing, and people really like you. Well, you know, who, who's going to go? You know what? That's just not me. I'm sorry. I'm you know I'm a dullard, and I never come up with any creative thoughts at all. And everybody hates me. No, no one thinks that about themselves. So, and then you just start boring in on, on closer details, depending on what comes back to you. So, in the cold reading, you ask a lot of questions. You know, I'm getting something here about some tension in your financial life at the moment. Oh my God, yes. You know, I'm uh, always having trouble making the you know ends meet. And so, everybody has financial trouble. Okay, and if you ask the question, then well, so tell me about your financial trouble or you know what is it in the in the your world of finances that that's troubling you and then they'll tell you and then you just feed it back and then afterwards they think that you got the information this is what this correspondent is talking about his wife is is remembering the hits and forgetting the misses the psychics will say all kinds of things you know i'm getting this or i'm getting that no 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 boom they get a hit that's what the person remembers confirmation bias and uh, we once did a show with ABC 2020 with James Van Prague. He didn't know I was involved. And I, you know, we set up the, the, the camera crew and I was in the back room just counting the number of statements he made. I actually had a little physical counter. Uh, uh, and then I just recorded the number of hits he got, you know, where the person would go, oh, yeah, oh, my God, that's right. Right. And it was like a 10 to 1, 20 to 1. Uh, of things he would just go i'm, I'm getting a, a a mark a mary a, you know a, 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 you know bob a, a richard a george george oh george yes well george is here with us now well what happened to all the other names uh pff, you know so uh, I, you know and people forget that and, and even some of the camera crew guys were like yeah how did he get that that's incredible i go well let's go back and watch the film again oh there it was well somebody will mention something like you know yesterday was my birthday and then like half an hour later, the psychic will come back. You know, I'm getting something about a birthday. Oh, I never told him it was my birthday. Yeah, you did actually 20 minutes ago. Look, and uh, so that's what's going on here um, with the warm reading. These are things that are true for everybody. You know, like um, if someone's lost someone, you know, men tend to keep their uh, like a grandfather or father's watch. I have my dad's watch. Um, and I noticed Van Prague was asking a lot, almost every guy he read, I'm getting something about a watch. What's this? When he, once he figured out it was a male figure but you can also get you know, i'm getting somebody passed over here feels like a father figure to me could be a father could be a grandfather could be an uncle could be a family friend could be anybody close to the family or friend or work with or no, broad enough that you're going to get a hit and then very specific things like uh you know a, you have a scar on your knee or you have an earring that you're missing the match to it and you're hanging on to it you have a power tool that's broken you've been hanging on to it thinking you'll fix it um, I, a number two in your address, um, you know, there's this whole books about this. Ian Rowland has a book, the full fact, full, the full facts book of cold reading. It's hundreds of things you can say that are pretty likely to get a, a, a positive nod from the person you're doing the reading on. And with a little bit of practice, uh, it's stunning how easy it is to get people to think you're psychic and you're not. Okay, Joan Rose, what compels a seemingly skeptical person who must apply reason and evidence in every aspect of their professional life in order to execute their profession successfully, doctor, attorney, scientist, anthropologist, etc., to suspend this very same skepticism and reasoning beyond all given evidence in order to support religious doctrine, Abrahamic religion specifically, at all costs? I am perplexed. Okay, dear perplexed. Joan Rose. Um, in fact, this is an argument uh, that Steven Pinker makes in his next book, Rationality, that I make also in uh, my next book on conspiracies, that actually most people are pretty rational um, in most areas. They hold down jobs, they pay their bills, they raise their kids, and so on. They, they, they can function uh, in a complex society pretty well, but they have what I call logic-type compartments. They just keep this one thing over here that they don't apply. And that certainly seems to be religion. I um, mean, if you just think about uh, the number of like scientists, even world-class scientists who believe that Jesus rose from the dead. Uh, Francis Collins, who I know, and I respect him very much, head of the Human Genome Project, now head of the National Institutes of Health, one of the most successful 
uh, smartest scientist of our generation, and he's a born again Christian. He said, thinks Jesus died for his sins. Okay, where's the control group? Okay, well, they're not thinking of it like that. They're not thinking like, well, this is an empirical truth, and I'm going to lay out the evidence and run the experiment, and then I'll believe what the evidence. To no, no, no. This has this is a completely different kind of belief, a religious truth, I call it, in which you just accept it or you don't. You know, if you're if you don't accept the resurrection of Jesus, you're not a Christian. That's the whole point of being a Christian. You should be a Jew or a Muslim or don't be any of it. Um, so the perplexness of it goes away once you think about different kinds of truths, empirical truths versus religious truths, and you can throw in uh, political truths as well um, that are not subject to the normal rules of reasoning about uh, empirical evidence. Dan Belden asks, what would you suggest the secular humanist approach might be to counter the right-wing male, and females too, white evangelicals interference that has turned the clock back on humanitarian progress? Too many to name. Well, okay, and it's not just from the right. You know, the regressive left, is, as they're called, the far-left progressive wing of the Democratic Party. Uh, in my mind, they've also turned back the clock on a lot of civil rights progress. But evangelicals have been at this for many decades, going back to the 1980s and the rise of the moral majority uh, and so forth, and their influence on Reagan and Bush and whatnot. Um, okay, so the counter to this is, is to uh, push the idea of rights. Uh, okay, the problem with secular humanism is that, A, it's often associated with the far left, and B, it's also often associated with atheism. So we got to get rid of both of those. Just say, no, no, uh, I'm an enlighten enlightenment humanist or I'm a scientific humanist. I just believe in human rights, civil rights, women's rights, gay rights, LGBTQ rights. I believe that in the freedom of speech and the separation of church and state and, and, and on and on and on. Just basically articulate the Constitution, the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution. These are two of the greatest documents ever written in a secular manner. Right? There's no God talk in there. You don't, uh, you don't have to believe in Jesus as your Savior in order to be uh, a constitutional republic. Okay, So uh, that's what I try to do. I try to enforce the, um, the positive, accentuate the positive, and attenuate the negative. I don't think atheism is negative, but you know, enough people do that you, you really just kind of have to leave that out of the conversation. Not an athe Atheism isn't even a belief. It's nothing. It's just lack of belief, full stop. Well, what do atheists believe? Well, it depends. It depends if they're liberal or conservative. It depends if uh, you know they believe in this form of economic policy or that form of taxation, whatever. I mean, it, it, they believe different things, uh, but it has nothing to do with the atheism, right? Bill Stepp asks, where do you go for your political views? So much of the media is biased one way or the other. How can I do my own unbiased analysis of political issues? How do you do this? Well, I read multiple sources, Wall Street Journal, New York Times, LA Times, even the local Santa Barbara news press here where I live. Um, and, and I just consume tons of content online, mainly through Twitter. I just get, uh, I follow quite a few people who just post articles that are worth reading. I could spend 10 hours a day doing nothing but reading online articles. There's so much great content, but you got to mix it up. And it's pretty clear uh, the bias that most sites have. Uh, either they announce it, you know, we're left-leaning or we're right-leaning. Um, but it, but even if not, you, you kind of get a sense. So I try to mix it up. Just try to think, well, if I'm reading an op-ed about uh, pro-life and why that's the best position, I'm going to go in search of one that argues for the pro-choice position or immigration, close the borders or open the borders or, you know, foreign policy. Should we be the world's policemen or not? And you know, I just try to get um, multiple perspectives of thoughtful commentators. I love reading like uh, Charles Krauthammer, George Will, these kind of conservatives. I'm not conservative, but um, they're so thoughtful in their arguments that uh, I feel if I haven't read them, then I don't really know what conservatives think. I, and I'm just kind of straw manning their positions. And so we want to steel man their position by actually reading their uh, their own works. Uh, so that's what I do. There are sites that you know that rank these different positions, um, and, uh, and by which you can assess uh, the value of of each of these sites. So I recommend those as well as fact checking sites. 
Daniel Malkin asks, what proof of aliens would convince you? <laughs> Aren't you worried that you're so convinced of their non-existence that even if crisp images appear, you'll say it's CGI? And if aliens address the nation on live TV, you'd say it's an actor in a suit. Okay, this is a really good point. Because, of course, I know I sound like a broken record who's just a denier, alien denier. Uh, but I think if we separate the questions, are they out there somewhere? Have they come here? Uh, these are two different questions, and they have two different uh, kind of forms of evidence we would accept. SETI scientists have a whole protocol in place about uh, what they would accept as a signal that represents a non-natural source of energy or information. Uh, this was played out nicely in uh, Sagan's uh, film Contact, based on his book, where the Jodie Foster character plays the astronomer sitting there with her cans on her ears on the hood of her car <laughs> listening to the signals. Not how it works, but it's all right. Uh, and, and all of a sudden, you know, there's a, a series of prime numbers, numbers divisible only by themselves and, um, well, three, right, prime numbers. And, and, um, uh, and, and so no rotating black hole or white dwarf or any other stellar object or astronomical phenomena we know of would, would uh, release signals in the form of a sequence of prime numbers. Um, so that would be a protocol in which you go, that constitutes a hit. So this has to do with what's called signal detection theory. That is, how do you know that the signal you're getting uh, represents this or that? It's an actual signal of what you're looking for, or it's just noise or some other artifact. You know, the classic case of this is during the Cold War, the detection of uh, incoming missiles to the Soviet Union from the United States. And um, the... The, the the officer on in uh, on duty, you know, observing the signals coming in of the missiles, had to decide: is are these incoming missiles, and I should trigger the you know launch on warning response from the Soviet Union and launching World War Three, or should I wait? And uh, and he decided to wait. Petrov is his name, and uh, so he's known as the man who saved the world. There's a documentary film and Netflix about his life and what he did. Well, he reasoned that. Um, there was just five blips. The United States was launching a first strike, nuclear strike against the Soviet Union. They wouldn't launch five missiles. It would be massive, right? So it's probably not that. Fortunately, it wasn't that. It was an artifact having to do with satellites or something like that. Um, no, maybe it was upper atmosphere birds or anyway. I, I forget what the actual thing was. But uh, but it, so it was a noise, not signal of that. So that's what we're talking about. Signals from space, do they constitute a, uh, evidence of extraterrestrial intelligence, or is it just something else? So this is what I think UFOs, UFOlogists need to do. They need to have some kind of signal detection criteria. What are we going to use to constitute a hit? What are we going to say, yeah, that one's real, that one probably... Yeah. And their problem is that they have no criteria. They'll accept anything, any story anybody has, you know, Farmer Bob. At three in the morning in Puckerbrush, Kansas, saw a light. Oh, okay, there's another data point. No, that's not a data point. <laughs> you know, and the UAPs, these, you know, grainy videos and blurry photographs of, you know, things that who knows what they're looking at. They have different explanations, but people just automatically go to, well, it's extraterrestrial. No, that that, that doesn't mean what it means. So what would, ex what, what would I accept? Well, okay, first of all, I would accept the SETI protocols if it was a, laser radio signal coming from space, something like the equivalent of a sequence of prime numbers. Um, I, to me, that said, yeah, okay, we could say that's a hit. Um, as for visitation, yes, it, it, we, we, could, it, we can't rely on videos anymore. CGI is too good. There's lots, there's a number of really good UFO fakes where you know, it's, they're not grainy videos or blurry photographs. They are clear as could be, but they're also quite fake. Um, so what we would need more than that. How about actual spacecraft or actual aliens. Not the alien autopsy film from the 90s that was pretty badly made and turned out to be a fake. You know, not a guy in an ape suit and so on. No, it's got to be something you can see, I could see, the world scientists can all uh, investigate and look at and, and so on. That, that's, that's what we need. Um, and, and not just by one team, not just one study, not just one report. 
but dozens or hundreds of you know converging lines of inquiry into that particular thing to determine whether it's true or not. Okay, uh, Dionysius, Ec I'm sorry, F. Capetus, I think this is Greek, um, asks, what exactly is the process of evolution and natural selection? Meaning, is it tied to a specific force of nature, like electromagnetism or strong force? Or is it some invisible force without agency that operates? Same goes with emergence and even means. What exactly is it? A force that affects like gravity? I'm confused as to what all this means, especially emergence and memes. Are memes real things or just invisible terms we create to make sense of actions between objects that haven't any physical representation? Is emergence a field energy between states we can't measure? Seems like there's a lot of invisible forces or whatever they are at work. Okay. Uh, no, there are, this is not a force. Natural selection is not a force. Uh, of nature like gravity or electromagnetism or so on. It's a descriptive process of what happens in nature. It is a human construct, specifically evolutionary theorists' construct. So in my book, Why Darwin Matters, the only book I have with full frontal nudity on the cover there, it's a chimp for those of you listening, I uh, open chapter one to say, what is evolution? What, what is this all about? So here I'm using um, uh, Ernst Mayer's uh, brilliant uh, outline of what evolution is. First, he defines it. Evolution is change in the adaptation and in the diversity of populations of organisms. Uh, and he famously defined uh, a species as a group of actually or potentially interbreeding natural populations reproductively isolated from other such populations. Um, which I had to memorize when I was in graduate school, when I took a course in evolutionary biology from Bayard Bradstrom. The un unforgettable, the inimitable Bayard Bradstrom. He had made us memorize that. Uh, and so Mayer outlines five general tenets of evolutionary theory that have been discovered in the years since Darwin published his revolutionary book. Okay, you'll notice these are all descriptions of things that happen in nature, not forces. One, evolution. Organisms change through time. Both the fossil record of life's history and nature today document and reveal this change. Two, descent with modification. Evolution proceeds through the branching of common descent. As every parent and child knows, offspring are similar to but not exact replicas of their parents, producing the necessary variation that allows adaptation to the ever-changing environment. Three, gradualism. All this change is slow, steady, and stately. Given enough time, small changes within a species can accumulate into large changes that create new species. That is, macroevolution is the cumulative effect of microevolution. And for multiplication. Evolution does not just produce new species, it produces an increasing number of new species. And of course, number five, natural selection. Evolutionary change is not haphazard and random, it follows a selective process. Co-discovered by Darwin and the naturalist Alfred Russell Wallace, natural selection operates under five rules. A. <laughs> so I numbered one through five and then A through E. A. Populations tend to increase indefinitely in a geometric ratio. 2, 4, 8, 16, 32, 64, 128, 256, 512, 1024, etc. B. In a natural environment, however, population numbers must stabilize at a certain level. Population cannot increase to infinity. The Earth is not big enough. C, therefore, so those are two observations and then our first induction. Therefore, there must be a struggle for existence. Not all of the organisms produced can survive. D, observation. There is variation in every species. And therefore, E, final conclusion, in the struggle for existence, those individuals with variations that are better adapted to the environment leave behind more offspring than individuals that are less well adapted. This is known as differential reproductive success. As Darwin said, as more individuals are produced and can possibly survive, there must in every case be a struggle for existence, either one individual with another of the same species or with the individuals of distinct species or with physical conditions of life. And here is what Darwin wrote in a famous passage in The Origin of Species, 1859. 
It may be said that natural selection is daily and hourly scrutinizing throughout the world every variation, even the slightest, rejecting that which is bad, preserving and adding up all that is good, silently and insensibly working whenever and wherever opportunity offers at the improvement of each organic being in relation to its organic and inorganic conditions of life. We see nothing of these slow changes in progress until the hand of time has marked the long lapses of ages. And then so imperfect is our view into long past geological ages that we only see that the forms of life are now different from what they formerly were. Okay, a couple points here. Darwin is writing uh, in a very kind of anthropocentric way or kind of an agency acting way, the language he's using, uh, talking about natural selection, like it's daily and hourly scrutinizing, uh, uh, preserving and adding up, like it's, a, it's doing some calculations. Okay, none of this is true. There's no agency behind natural selection. There is no natural selection. That's just a word we use to describe what's going on in nature. That's why I always thought his opening chapter in The Origin of Species on artificial selection, p pigeon breeders, for example, was, I, I understand what he was doing, but it's a bit misleading because there are pigeon breeders. These are intelligent designers designing pigeons to, <laughs> by breeding them. Okay, this is not what natural selection is doing. There's nobody selecting anything. There's no agent at all, right? And he, he uses the word progress. There's no progress in the way we typically use that word in the Western world, like things get better or more complex and so on. Most living organisms are relatively simple and they do just fine. They're not progressing to become anything. They're just perfectly well adapted. Um, you know, take sharks, for example. They're, 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 they're really good at what they do. They're dumb as a post, but they can do what they do. Just You don't need a big brain. You don't need intelligence, sentience. In fact, very few organisms have what we have a brain like ours, you don't need that, really. So it's a great mystery why we have our, that's a different subject. Anyway, so that's the point of that. Uh, I mean, this goes on and on. If you want to take an entire course, you can spend 15 weeks dissecting everything I just read right there because there's lots of spin-offs on that. You know, like maybe it's not so gradual. You know, Steve Gould, is, um, Niles Eldridge's theory of punctuated equilibrium. People, again, misunderstood this, like there's some force that drives evolution to happen rapidly. No, there's no force. Punctuated equilibrium, they're just two words to describe um, in a different context of different kinds of speciation, this um, type of speciation where there's a founder population that breaks off from the larger population. There's few individuals, so um, the, the gene pool can change fairly rapidly. And so you get this kind of rapid change uh, because of the small number of individual organisms in the population on an island, say, for example, that's isolated from other islands, then you get rapid change. And in the fossil record, all you see is, you know, the fossils from the big population, the fossils from the small, rapidly changing population, and so on. It looks like something all of a sudden sped up, like it was punctuated equilibrium. And there was even an X-File episode where some monsters uh, were created uh, out of these humans and it, and and Scully or, or Mulder, whoever it was, I think it was Scully, attributed to punctuated equilibrium. No, that's not what's going on. Anyway, okay, that's enough of my my riff on that. Okay, Richard Audet asks: Currently, any vaxxers are spreading astounding lies on social media about the COVID nineteen vaccines. Their lies are persuading people to not get vaccinated and take on enormous risk. Many will get sick, and some will die due to following anti-vaxxers' advice. Is there any way, in the U.S. context in particular, of holding them liable for the harm they cause? Wow. Okay, so this is um, the subject of an article I just published. Uh, I'm recording this on August 15th, so it just came out yesterday at Quillette, called Vexed by the Anti-Vax... Vexed by the Unvaxed, um, in which I offered three three explanations for the kind of motivation behind uh, the anti-vax or vaccine hesitancy, as it's now called. Uh, one is the vaccines themselves. Most people are uncomfortable with this idea of you know, sticking a needle in my arm and injecting a piece of the actual disease. Okay, that's not what the COVID-19 vaccines are. They're a whole new M uh, <laughs> mRNA vaccine. There's no piece of the SARS-CoV-2 virus in there at all. You're not getting any of the disease or the virus 
Um, it's just kind of tricking your body into how to read these little protein spikes that when you do get the virus, it responds accordingly. It's, it's an amazing uh, invention, but, 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 I, but I get the psychology of it. And, um, and then there's a ton of misinformation about this uh, that, you know, it causes sterility or it causes shock, anaphylactic shock, or it causes uh, uh, heart attacks or strokes or, you know, but these have all been debunked. Um, and people are missing the bigger picture comparing the ravages of COVID-19, which are on the news every night, to the handful of side effects. No medical treatment of any kind, including vaccines, are 0% side effects with no negative consequences at all. None. Everything in life as a risk, as Thomas, as Thomas Sowell likes to say, there are no solutions. There's just trade-offs. Okay, so it's worth the trade-off of risking the tiny, tiny, tiny probability of a side effect from the vaccine from the much higher probability of the ravages of COVID-19. Okay, so that gets to the, you know, the second thing, the politicization of it, um, that, you know, people that have kind of made that an issue of more left or right and all the misinformation uh, that has gone on with that. Uh, so I counter that in those arguments that really the, the, you know, the Delta variant has shown us that, you know, where, where the, the most Republican, least vaccinated, uh, they're being hit the hardest by the Delta variant, quite clear in the data. Um, I mean, so conservatives who call themselves the party of life, you know, we're pro-life. Well, how about being pro-vaccine because vaccines save lives? Okay, that, that's a good argument for conservatism. You know, you guys should be at the forefront of promoting vaccines. Okay, so, and then the, the last one is people have a misunderstanding of freedom. They think, well, freedom means I can do whatever I want. No, it, that's not what it means. It's never meant that. Uh, you you are mis, misunderstanding what freedom means. We all give up tons of freedom to live in a civil society where I can be safe and free from your germs. Analogously, uh, you're not free to drive on any side of the road you want. I should be free to drive on the right side of the road without worrying about you deciding you're going to drive in the opposite direction, in my lane. Okay? Now, everybody, including and especially conservatives who consider themselves law and order party, you know, we believe in the rule of law and the Constitution. Okay, well, we have laws. <laughs> we have rules about things that, you know, that we all should be free from your crazy behavior, okay, in every other area. Conservatives are on board with this. You know, the restaurant should be free to say no shoes, no shirt, no service. Conservatives go, yeah, that's right. How about no mask? You have to have a mask. Oh, no, my freedom. No, you're, you're hopelessly confused uh, about what freedom means. It means a civil society gives up all sorts of things to have a better life, including more freedom. I should... You know, the libertarian line about uh, the freedom to swing your arm ends at my nose. Well, the freedom to cough and sneeze your virus ends at my nose and my mouth, okay? So, same application there. Okay, I think that's enough for this AMA. I have lots more questions, uh, and I could ramble on till the cows come home, but uh, I think that's enough for now. Anyway, thank you for listening, and let's do the next 100 uh, episodes. I'm averaging two a week, so we can get there in the next year. And... Um, and again, thank you for your support. If you want to support the podcast, go to skeptic.com slash donate uh, for your tax-deductible donation to the society that supports the podcast. Thanks for listening.